Namaste. And welcome to the introduction to our latest series on spiritual music. Now, first thing that comes up is, what took you so long? <laughs> I know, I know. I've been doing spiritual music since I was in my early 20s, when I was a student of Ali Akbar Khan, a great sarod player from Calcutta. But then he introduced me to my spiritual master, my Adi Guru, Srila Prabhupada. And when he took me to meet Prabhupada, he told me, you know, you're not the right kind of person to be a touring concert musician, he said. That's a tough life and you're too soft hearted. You'd have trouble with the constant travel and uprooting and the criticism and the fights and the egos and all that. He said, you should be a temple musician, a kirtaniya. I said, well, I don't know anything about that. How do I learn? He said, I'll introduce you. So he took me to meet his longtime friend, Srila Prabhupada. They're both from Calcutta. And I got into spiritual life really seriously. And for a long time, I just went along with what I was taught. But then I reached a point where it was unsatisfying and I had to go higher. I had so many doubts about spiritual life in general and the devotional path that I was taught in particular. So I had to go on a long kind of detour. It's been like 10 years now since I was writing songs in that mood. And I'm finally satisfied. I finally have overcome all my doubts and I feel very happy. See, for me to write music, I have to be happy. Huh? If I'm feeling doubtful, uncertain, unclear, or depressed, I don't want to write music. I can't write music. The muse doesn't speak to me. And you know, when you make up stuff, yeah, sure, I, I know all the formulas and I can make stuff up. It doesn't sound convincing. It doesn't sound authentic. So now, finally, after so many years, I'm in the right mood again to make music. I'm in love. <laughs> in love with the goddess Brahman, the self, Shiva, and also with the whole process of self-realization. I finally got it, you know? The whole thing, everything I always wanted to understand, to realize. I'm finally happy with myself, in other words. So as uh, one of my old bandmates, Bruce Walkup, if you're out there, Bruce, give me a shout. <laughs> he wrote a song called Satisfied. He said, you gotta satisfy yourself before you can somebody else. You gotta satisfy yourself before you love somebody else. Uh, it was a pretty cool song. But anyway, now I'm satisfied. I feel like I can go ahead with making music. And so I invested in some latest studio tools. And I've got a nice setup now, very happy with it. And I'm already using it to make music. So now that we've covered my <laughs> motivation, why I'm doing this, what is spiritual music? Well, spiritual music is music that embodies spiritual values. You know, just like there's rock music, jazz music, rap music, classical music, whatever, you know, Kletzmer, <laughs> Peruvian mountain music, you know, every kind of music. And they each embody the values of the culture in which they are a part. So in Vedic culture, 
Vedic culture, to my mind, is the highest spiritual culture on the planet. And it embodies certain spiritual values, and they are perfectly expressed in the style of music, Vedic music. There was a little sample right in the beginning, a little like 20 second clip, just to show the titles. But it's also there as an example of what these values are. And you'll find when you hear this music, you get a sense of peace. You get a sense of detachment. Uh -huh. A real sense of happiness. Happiness being the absence of suffering. And you get a feeling of exaltation, excitement in a good way. One becomes enthusiastic to do spiritual things like puja and meditation and seva. So why is this music so effective? Why does it give <laughs> these effects? I'm laughing because this is the question that I had that I used to test my teachers. And when I was in conservatory back in 1965, I asked my teachers. I was studying composition with someone who had gone to the Sorbonne, you know, one of the best music schools in the world. I asked her, how does music affect people emotionally? How and why? She couldn't answer. And actually, the answer is very deep. It's complex. It has a lot to do with cultural conditioning. In other words, context and background. But there are some absolutes. And we're going to go into that in detail in this series. How and why music affects people emotionally. Nobody could answer this question for years until I met Ali Akbar Khan. <laughs> I asked him the same question. Uh, this is my test. <laughs> and he said, oh, it's rasa. Boom, finished. I said, well, what is this rasa? And then he started to explain to me, and it's very, very deep. We have a series on it that touches a little bit of the uh, intricacies of the concept of rasa. But rasa basically means emotions. Not ordinary emotions, but emotions in relation with God, with the Supreme, the Absolute, however we conceive of the Absolute, whether a personal God or Brahman or Shiva Shakti or however we conceive of God. We have a certain relationship with that. And that relationship, the mood and the flavor of that relationship is rasa. So there are five principal rasas. Neutrality, servitude, friendship, parenthood, and conjugal love. So generally conjugal love is considered to be the highest, but they're all spiritual. So in capsule, spiritual music is that music which expresses rasa. How does it do that? Why does it affect us the way it does? These are questions we're going to be addressing as we go through this series in as many parts. Now let's go back to that little introduction. I'm going to play it again here. What's the first thing you notice about it? The drone. The drone is the component of Vedic music that makes us feel grounded, stable, safe. Hmm? 
like this is a great ship plowing through the waters of the world, which can never be disturbed. And that's Brahman. When we're in touch with Brahman, we feel completely grounded, completely stable, protected, safe, and able to dream whatever we want to dream. And what's the next component? The drums, huh? These drums are just amazing. Indian drums are the most amazing drums. This particular piece is called a lehra. Lehra means a repetitive melodic figure that is played as a background to a drum solo, uh, with the drummers showing off their virtuosity. So we have a couple of repetitions of just the regular standard beat. Oh, it's in 10 beats, by the way. <laughs> Japtal. Japtal is 10 beats. Two, three, two, three. So there's two repetitions of that. And then he goes into a wild solo and an ending. And then there's the sarod. The sarod is the plucked instrument that you hear. And the special thing about melodies in Indian music, Vedic music, is that the melodies are in a certain tuning. It's not an ordinary Western tuning. And we'll go into how that is made and why it is and how it affects you emotionally and why certain ragas have tones missing from the scale and all kinds of details. We're going to go deep into that. But the thing to notice about it is it repeats the same melodic figure like three times. That's the lehra. And then at the end, there's a tana. A tana is when the when the alternate melody is repeated three times in a rhythmic, catchy rhythmic way to lead into an ending or transition or a new cycle. So all these elements are part of Vedic music, important parts, but not the main part. If you have to ask me, what is the main part? What is the most important thing about Vedic music that distinguishes it from other types of music and is responsible for its extraordinary spiritual effects? I would have to say it's the tuning. The tuning is called swara. Swara is a special way of tuning the instruments so that they produce the most beautiful sounds and if you're into sacred geometry and all that, the waves of sound in the room form sacred geometric patterns. Like, for example, yantras. And we'll be discussing this in detail in some of the later uh, episodes of this series. This is not like a professional level series. We're not going to go too deep into the science of acoustics and so on, but we have to go a certain amount into it in order to explain how the music works and why it is the way it is and why it has to be that way. But as far as we're concerned, the reason for the music being tuned in a certain way is that it carries the rasa. So the rasa is the emotions, and these are something universal. Uh, you'll find every kind of people all around the world interpret these emotional uh, sounds in the same or very similar ways. So we're going to be going into this and showing how the music works and then giving you some processes that you can do and sound backgrounds and everything for meditation. So this will help you very much in your spiritual life. Aung Tat Sat. Aung Shakti Aung.